a dash that called her because it'll knock out the goal.
Okay, first of all, how are you? It's Val Jaruf. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to uh, tonight's talk. Um, I'm Shona McClellan, and I'm the project officer for Dochus Namara, which is a project with Museum Nanilain. And um, as part of that project, we have had funding from Borsna Gaelic and from Museums Gallery Scotland, which has allowed us to carry out a series of talks. And this tonight's talk is one of is the last one in the series, uh, which is the Vikings as Navigators and Here Sails the Sea Brave with Professor Donna Hedel, which I, who I'll introduce in a minute. I have a few um, notifications, first of all, before we start. Um, can you please make sure that all your mics and cameras are off? This allows the connection to be as strong as we possibly can get it. Um, I realise that sometimes our, the quality might not be too, too great, but um, I'm afraid that's out with our control. Um, also, we are also live streaming on YouTube at the moment. So if um, you do unmute at any point, uh, please make sure you do not, do not swear and we'll also not accept any unacceptable behaviour. If you do, I will do, uh, I will kick you out, basically. Um, I have that power, so um, I will meet you all. Um, before we start, um, yeah, I would just like to introduce Don, Professor Donna Hedel, who is with UHI, the University of the Highlands and Islands, and she will be um, talking about the Vikings as navigators here sails sea brave. So I'm just now going to pass her over to Donna. Um, there will be time at the end for questions. And if you do want to ask any questions, can you please use the raise your hand function as we're finding that when people are using the chat function to ask questions, these are popping up on the live feed and it's um, distracting. So if we could just use the hand, uh, the raise your hand function at the end, that would be great. So I'll now pass it over to Donna. Uh, thanks very much. Um, can you see my, my first slide there, uh, Shona, or am I needing to do something? Uh, you'll need to share. Ah, yes. Sorry, I thought I'd already done that. I'm obviously not forceful enough with the buttons. <laughs> That'll be what it is. Just a moment, if you bear with me, and I'll yes, just do that. Fine. I'll wait until it appears. Right, I'll just get that slide up now. Sorry, okay. I thought I had done this already. A bit irritating. There we go. Yeah. How's that? Perfect. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much. And thanks very much to you all for coming along this evening to hear me talk about one of my favourite subjects, which is the Vikings as navigators. Now, the first slide you can see there, I, I love a map. So that's a map that very cl clearly puts Orkney in the, se uh, the centre of the universe. If you'll see on the, the right hand side of the map there, it says orchids. So that's why I like that map in particular. Um, and the slide on the other side is where I get the, the quote, here sails the sea brave. This is a very rare example. It's a wooden rune stick and it's got a depiction of Viking ships on it. And the, uh, the runes for here sails the sea brave. It's from Bergen and it's the inspiration really for the talk tonight. Now, for centuries, the navigation of the Norsemen was focused on the main on oral tradition and experience. This is why we don't know more about them. They were perhaps the greatest sailors since the Phoenicians, and yet we don't know very much about it. The wonderful knowledge and the skill which enabled them to cross and recross cross enormous stretches of water, um, uh, open sea in the face of gales, the fogs, the unknown surface currents, centuries before the advent of the magnetic compass, which they did not have, of course, anything like that, um, was theirs by the mouth and the hand of the generations that had gone before them. Now, we don't start to see the first primitive sailing directions come into existence till the later Middle Ages, uh, which is quite well after the Viking period in many ways. And it's probably largely for this reason that so little is known about um, the particular methods that the Norsemen used to navigate the, sea, the, the seven seas, if you like. We do have evidence from the sagas. We know, um, for example, that, that there's emphasis laid on the mariner's, uh, the mariner's dependence on celestial bodies, for example. For example, in two separate occasions in Njal saga, crews which had been in the state of Hafila or Marund were warned by the, uh, of the proximity of land by a telltale groundswell. 
Um, on the second of these occasions, which was actually off Hrose or um, in the Orkney Islands, it's recorded that there were heavy overfalls in the vicinity. Flossie then said, as Niall Saga has, has it, that they must be somewhere near land and there must be a shoal over which the seas were breaking. It was thick and blowing weather. The ship took um, the ground and broke up. Uh, so we do have mentions in the sagas. We have mentions about how important the ships were, how important it was to look after them, um, the places that they sailed. We, in fact, the, the sagas were written very much after the, the time of the events that they um, detailed. So we find it's often easier to plot a sea journey from information in the sagas than it is to plot a land journey. So what evidence do we actually have for what we know about knowledge and skill related to science in medieval Old Norse communities. Well, of course, we have dedicated texts on ast astronomy, time reckoning and encyclopedic matters. Um, we do have some of this um, and I'll talk about that later on. Uh, we have short text inserts in various manuscripts. We have pedagogic texts, for example, the Norwegian's King's Mirror from around 1260. Uh, we have the saga literature itself. That's the main body of information that we have. Um, uh, we have the excavation of ships and sailing gear, which has been so important and useful to us, and the fact that replicas have been made uh, from them, so we can see how these things were actually sailed. Uh, we also have our historical and archaeological facts, uh, uh, such as basically the existence of where the permanent Viking settlements were. The ones overseas demonstrate the capability of maintaining regular ocean traffic, for example. For example, I'm thinking about the excavation in Longso Meadow in, in Newfoundland. Obviously, they could get there. So the question is, why and how were they doing it? Well, um, there's many reasons why the, the Vikings took to the sea, um, one of which was, um, uh, I suppose, really the search for adventure, uh, for money and for glory. These are very important things. The fundamental issues um, for Vikings are to create a great name for themselves, um, to win wealth and, and good fortune. And one of the ways of doing this is to be chosen to go on a sea voyage. But what the, the main kind of factor towards this is perhaps the westward expansion. And there we are. I love a map, me, so I'm going to put this up here. And uh, the maritime ex expansions from the, the Viking homelands, if you like, and I am going to use the term Viking in this instance, because this is talking about being on the sea, this is talking about adventure and so on. So this activity that they're doing is indeed uh, a Viking activity. Okay, uh, we, when we think about these sea voyages, we think about rates, of course, and as you can see on the map there, they, those are the dates when they reach certain places. For example, they, we first see them in um, England in about 793, uh, Dublin 795, um, Normandy 911, for example, but uh, they sail all the way down to Istanbul, which is what's called Miklagard on the bottom right hand of your screen there, you'll see it at uh, uh, 839 and so on and so forth. So they were clearly able to get about. And we can't underestimate the high levels of seamanship and skill that allowed them to navigate to these places. They mastered the sea routes to Shetland and Orkney, which is where I am today, um, to Scotland, to England, to Ireland, but they, they, they ventured further west to the Faroes, um, whose settlement was initiated by Grimmer Kamban and his company about uh, 825. In fact, you can see it there, Faroe on the map. Um, their arrival, um, you know, there so was just one stage on their journey to the west, uh, culminating in them reaching what they called Vinland in roughly 80,000, but they didn't just go to the West. Sometimes when people think about Viking navigation and Viking journeys, they think about them going to America. But they navigated the rivers of Europe, the great rivers of Europe, and they sailed all the way down to uh, Istanbul. And they established mercantile uh, networks, uh, familial mercantile networks, while they did that as well. So, but there was continuous traffic. There's not just raiding parties, there's also merchant trips as well, and we'll come back to that in a moment when we look at the different kinds of ships, in fact. So this is, you know, they're, they're, they're trading, they're creating networks, they're exploring new places. You can see on your map there at 854 Novgorod, for example, Novgorod has a Viking ship as part of its, its city arms that was removed during the Soviet era, but has now been returned. The name Russia itself may well derive from a local term for the, the Vikings as Rusa or the, the men who rode. There's other derivations, but that is quite an attractive one. But what I'd like to talk about is the Viking ship, 
if you like, perhaps the greatest technical and artistic achievement of the European early Middle Ages. Or, uh, these fast ships, and here's an example of it um, on a piece of jewellery, for example, it just shows how important they were that you find images of ships everywhere. They had the strength to survive ocean crossings while having a, a draft of as little as 50 centimetres. That's 20 inches. That's how much draft they had in the water. It allowed navigation in very shallow water. For example, that's how they won Normandy. If we can just go back to the, the map again, that one there, you can see Normandy 9-11. What they did was they sailed up uh, the Seine in their ships because of this very shallow draft. And the King of the Franks basically opened his curtains one morning and found the place was full of Viking ships. So he gave them Normandy, the place of the Normans, um, to pacify them. So they're very, very flexible ships because of this draft, this, this little draft. Um, and permanent settlers then uh, were, were quite easily transported to quite difficult places uh, because of this draft as well. The ships were an incredibly important part of society, hence them appearing on things like the jewellery and so on, not just because of the transportation, but because they were an, an, an object of prestige. And the ship's master and the ship's company had formed almost a kind of a co-op-like arrangement by which they all got benefit from the voyages and so on. It was that uh, you had pre prestige on the owner, on the shipper, and indeed on the crew. Without these ships, the Norsemen could not have expanded their um, dealings in the way that they did. So we see them on jewellery, uh, we see them on memorial stones, we see them on coins from the Viking Age. For example, we see the importance of ships. Now, the one thing I have to say about ships, you know, when it comes to burials, for example, I know everybody loves the film The Vikings and the bit at the end where Tony Curtis says, prepare a funeral for a Viking and they set uh, Kurt Douglas off in his ship and burn it. This did not happen as much as you might think. This is what was more likely to happen, where there would be a, a kind of a, a shape of a ship as part of the burial because ships were too important to burn. Uh, my husband is um, very much descended from the first settlers to Orkney, and he built a ship, a ship, a boat, I should say. And I said to him, well, when you pop your clogs, my love, do you want me to push you off at Scapa, which is one of the bays here, and set fire to you? And he said, which I'm sure is, would have been the exact response of a Norseman back in the day, that would be a waste of a good boat. So the, the notion of the ship, the, the importance of the ship, the significance of the ship at every part of life, very significant, boat burnings, not so much. So I'm sorry if you're all dashed um, about that, but that that was not what happened, of course. OK, so let's talk about the ship then. Let's have a wee look. Right. The picture on the left basically shows a sketch of the side view and hull section and photo of a 9th century ship that was recovered early in the 20th century in Oseberg. Uh, this was part of a very rich burial. You might like to know that the person buried in, buried in this ship was in fact a woman. It's one of the richest burials they've ever found. She was obviously a woman of great status. Um, and it's now on display near Oslo and you can find pictures of it everywhere. It's really handy. Now, the Oseberg ship, when it was first discovered because it was a rich burial, they thought it was re more representative perhaps of a royal yacht rather than a proper warship. But more recent research because um, Scandinavian colleagues have made replicas shows that it was perfectly capable of taking to the open ocean. Um, and you can see sections of it there and, 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 and how it works. Um, in the 1970s, five 11th century ships were found and recovered from the School de Narrows in Denmark, which give us more examples of the variety of ships used in the Viking Age. And actually these ships who, that were probably at the end of their useful life had actually been intentionally scuttled to block the channel during a raid, which is a device that was still used here in Orkney in the Second World War before they built the Churchill Barriers, actually. They used block ships. So uh, here's the Osberg ship, which is a fine example of the, the, the most luxurious type of ship, but it's very much a Viking warship. There were really two different classes of Viking era ships, which were found. The warships, called Langskips, there, um, and the merchant ships, called Hnor or Knorr, whatever you like. So you've got your warship on the left there and you've got your merchant ship, which is wider um, on the right. Typically the warship would be narrower, it would be longer and shallower than the merchant ship and it's powered by oars, as you can see from this very accurate drawing there, <laughs> uh, supplanted of course by sail. I'll come back to that too. The warship's completely open, it's built for speed and uh, manoeuvrability. In contrast, the merchant ship is uh, partially enclosed, you can see that on the deck there, and powered primarily by the sail. 
cargo carrying capability, of course, is the main objective here. And when they set out, out in the merchant ships, they, it wasn't that they were going back and forth every day. They would choose their time of year very, very carefully. They would take all the, the omens for the journey from and soothsayers and things like that and go for, you know, one or two profitable voyages a year. <clears throat> so it's very important that you can carry as much cargo as is humanely possible. So um, the two school delivery warships are narrower and less spacious than the Ozeberg one. Um, this gives you a kind of example of what the warships would look like. A, a typical warship could have had as much as 16 rowers or even more on each side. And the shields might have been arrayed along the gunwales and held in place by a shield rack. This kept them out of the way, but also provided some slight additional protection against the wind and the waves as well, because this is a very open thing, that this is not a luxury vessel. You know, basically there are no home comforts on this at all. You're basically sitting on a seat, you've perhaps got a leather sack to sleep in or whatever it might be, and that's about it. This is all about lightness, it's all about manoeuvrability, it's all about speed. We know, for example, that um, Hawken Hawkinson was able to get from Bergen to Sumbara in um, the Shetland Islands in less than three days in one of these. these. These are very, very fast vessels. These are why the Vikings were able to control such large tracts of land, uh, or large tracts of sea and land, I should say, because it's very, very speedy. Okay, and um, as you can see in this next slide, Coins there and uh, pictures, stones uh, from the right, show how the shields were arrayed along the side of the ship there, the gunwale of a, a Viking ship. However, and there's a kind of a reconstruction of it there in the in the picture at the bottom, as it's lying on the side of the ship there, but of course they weren't routinely displayed, that wouldn't have been practical. Um, on some ships, the, the shields interfere with the oar holes. Uh, preventing the oars from being used. Shield racks in which the shields were fastened were not robust and probably were incapable of holding the shields securely in rough seas. So this is more of a ceremonial display. When they come into harbour, up with the shields, on with the dragon head, the whole thing, uh, make a big show when you come in. Um, and modern sailors of replica ships say that it's very impractical indeed to have the shields <laughs> like that. Um, perhaps they were only displayed for battle or to make the ship look especially fine as I said, when they're approaching the land. The Land Nama book tells of uh, Helle Bjorn uh, Herfinsson, who sailed into Bjarnafjörder with his ship lined with shields. And afterwards, he's known as uh, Skelda Bjorn or Shield Bjorn because of this. Um, so the, the oars of the Gokstad ship, for example, varied in length from about 5.3 to 5.85 metres, about 17 to 19 feet in old money, which is actually what I find easier to work with when it comes to that, according to where they were used in the ship. So it's really quite an efficient arrangement. And the oar holes, I'll just see if I, yes, um, there's your oar holes there. Um, were not a uniform distance above the waterline, and so the length of each oar was chosen so they all hit the water in unison. Now, you can see there, you've got your oar hole and you've got something to shut it with in case of bad weather, So that, because otherwise these would be holes in the side of the ship that would let water come in. And you can see from the little drawing there how that would operate in terms of the ship. And you can see how shallow the draft of the ship is from this little cross section that I have at the bottom there. Now, they were usually made of pine with a narrow blade, which makes for a very efficient and lightweight oar. Um, and uh, it's, it's particularly effective from that point of view. The oar holes of the Gottstadt ship that was found were only 16 inches above the deck. And uh, most likely each crewman's sea chest doubled as a, as a rowing bench as well when they sat in it. So it's all very stiff, simple and straightforward. And as you can see, they were sealed with these covers, which were, and sh shows you there in the bottom picture on the left, how that would operate. So warships typically had minimal decking with removable planks um, under the rowers laid on the cross beams and small raised platforms at the bow and stern. stern. When uh, you were anchored or you were in harbour, there'd be an awning arrayed overhead to provide some protection from the elements and so on. The single square rigged sail that they had allowed sailing close to the wind. This ability combined with their capability to row during adverse wind conditions allowed the sailors to run into shore, engage the enemy on land and escape retribution at will. Um, we know that these um, th these are very manoeuvrable. The Helga Ask is a modern replica of the smaller of the two school delivery warships. It's based at the Roskilde Ship Museum in Denmark. And if you ever get a chance to go there, do go and have a look at it. Um, and when it was taken out and sailed, they reported that with a full crew of 24 at the oars, she's capable of a speed of four knots, which is really quite impressive, but only 
for about 15 minutes, which is when the canoe collapses from exhaustion. Perhaps they're not as hardy as the Vikings of old. Um, for longer stretches, two to three knots is probably our top speed when being rowed. Um, another clue to the speed capabilities of these ships comes from linguistic studies. There's a term, vika silver, uh, which is the distance a man should work the oars before he should be released. And this distance was set to a thousand strokes, about two hours work. This modern term is equivalent um, to about four nautical miles, implying that a speed of two knots, in fact, was typical. Now, there were much larger warships, and I'll just give you a wee example here. This is obviously a painting, but um, this is King Olaf Tryggvason's Ormur and Langir, the Long Serpent, at the Battle of um, Svalert here. Um, and they were much longer and carried far more rowers than typical warships. Now, this is obviously a battle scene. Um, and uh, one of the most important things is that, of course, the Norsemen did not wear horned helmets. If they'd worn horned, horned helmets, this type of close fighting on board a ship, they would easily have had an eye out and uh, done themselves more damage than good. Um, we found wrecks at the end of the 20th century that confirm that ships such as the Ormorin Lange did indeed exist. And um, Norway was, is in the process of building a replica, they might have finished it now, of a ship of exactly this size. So sea battles in the Viking Age then were fought on stationary ships and were more like land battles waged on kind of floating islands. Because bear in mind, the ship's the important thing. You do not risk the ship. They're too important to the economy. They're too important to your status. You don't risk them. OK, so sails would be furled and people would, in fact, battles would not take place in the open sea. They were more likely to take place in the lee of an island or in some safe place where the ship could be protected, so on. Um, and basically, opposing crews would try to board the outermost ships in a, a, a kind of fleet that would be kind of tied together to protect one another with a view of, of clearing the deck of the enemy, not ruining the ship. Yeah. So a warship was a valuable item, not only for the prestige and uh, um, the monetary value, but also for her utility in future battles. So the important thing is to get a hold of the ship. I cannot tell you how important these ships were. And the reason for that, to go back to the shallow draft, this is obviously a very accurate um, and, uh, you know, contemporary drawing is not there, but it had several advantages. They could raid well inland, just as they did to get Normandy, by sailing far up rivers that were too shallow for typical seagoing vessels um, of the day. They also, uh, the shallow draft also meant they could set, set up impregnable bases deep within enemy territory. They could land anywhere there was a shelving beach. They didn't need a harbour. You could get right in there, you could get right into the battle, and you could get right back into your ship really quickly. And archaeological evidence actually supports um, the view that the ships were beached regularly. The school uh, ships have wear on their keels consistent with sand and gravel landings. In addition, the shallow uh, draft made for fast and easy disembarkation. You could be certain, you, uh, these Vikings, when they're loping over the side of that ship, they are certain that they're going to jump into water that would hardly be over their knees. And the crew could leave the ship and join the raid quickly and confidently. Of course, under more normal conditions, uh, conventional methods of boarding the ships were also available. Uh, we, find, we found a gangplank on board the Oseberg ship, for example. Um, we, we don't see an awful lot of evidence of harbours with jetties for docking a ship. This would have been more useful, of course, um, for something like um, a merchant ship. They would need that to unload and so on. But you can see how flexible and, and speedy these things were. And for, but voyages must have been very difficult for passengers and crew. The ships were completely open, folk were exposed to the elements, people slept where they could, probably between the thwarts, for example. They used the, the leather sleep sack I was alluding to earlier, perhaps in which to sleep at night and to shore their belongings during the day. Food would have been dried, possibly smoked or salted, or they might have caught fresh fish. They would probably have had water in skin bags and maybe thin sour ale or um, milk and so on. They wouldn't have been cooking aboard the ship, for example. Uh, it appears from Lan Nama book, for example, that ships and lives were routinely lost during ocean crossings. Of the 25 ships that set out one summer from Iceland, according to Lan Nama book, uh, carrying settlers to Greenland, only 14 survived. So there's an element of uh, risk there. So they were very careful when they set out to make sure that they'd taken into account um, uh, all the issues that they might have to consider when it came to weather and so on. Uh, smaller cargo ships would, were used on the rivers, notably on the Viking trade routes in Russia. Uh, these ships had larger crews, and these ships could be portaged 
if, if needed, i.e. picked up and carried. And we know that the, the Norse did this in Orkney and Shetland. There's a place in Shetland called Mavis Green where they reenacted this, carrying the, um, the ships over the isthmus of land. We have place names in Scotland like Tarbert, which is, means an isthmus of land. And quite often the Vikings would use a place like that to bring their ships inland. We know that they, uh, they had Viking galleys on Loch Lomond at one stage, for example. Now they were built very carefully using the clinker technique here and the lower edge of each hull plank, if you can see it there, uh, overlaps the upper edge of the one below. The planks and the streaks were riveted together using iron rivets and, and, and washers. And you can see an assortment of iron rivets and washers to the left. It's in the left picture there. And they were usually about three inches long, for example. The total weight of rivets and washers used in the construction of a typical ship was about 330 pounds, a very substantial and expensive amount of iron in the Norse era. And we, we know that this is the value of this is apparent. There's a, an incident told in chapter two of uh, Grenlandiga Theter. Sigurdr and his party come uh, upon two ships breached next to a hut in the Greenland wilderness. Everyone from the ships is dead and one of the ships is badly damaged. Sigurdr has the rivets pulled and collected, then he burns the wreck. He returns home with the valuables and the undamaged ships, as, as ship rather, as well as with the bones of the dead men, so they could be buried in the churchyard. But it's very important uh, to take the, the meals with you. Um, the ships, the, the streaks were lashed to the frame using flexible lashings rather than being firmly fixed. This meant there was a flexibility; they could move. Basically, as a result, the ships could ride over the waves rather than taking the full impact of each swell. And you can see uh, the cross section there. Um, it's showing uh, how the, um, it's the planking actually of the Gugstadt ship, showing how each plank was fastened to the frame. You see the, the rib there and you can see how it's all, it's all done there. And they would seal cracks with moss or animal hair coated with tar. Um, uh, but it did make them uh, prone to leaks, especially in, in rough sea. And you would have to be, you'd have to be ready to bail out the, the whole thing there too. In chapter 17 of Greta's saga, there's a description of bailing through rough seas. The crew was forced to bail round the clock. Two buckets were used with a full one carried up while the empty one was passed back down. And when Greta took over uh, filling the buckets, eight men were needed to empty the buckets in order to keep up with them. Because the one thing we know about Greta is that he was very strong. They were made of oak. The tall, um, the masts were usually constructed of uh, one tall straight tree. We know that the archaeological evidence shows us that the quality of the timbers declined throughout the Norse era. Later ships were made with planks that were shorter and less broad because there were fewer high quality oak trees left, of course. Um, some ships were built with wood salvaged from other ships, earlier ships, as we can see in the School de la Five ship, which is a rather poorer instruction, construction. Um, they, they created the, the planks and the logs very much in situ and, and, and took them down to be constructed. OK, um, Ola Kremlin Pedersen has estimated that for a typical 20 metre, 65 foot long ship, approximately five, um, 58 rather cubic metres, that's 2000 cubic feet of oak was required. That's equivalent to 11 tree trunks, each one metre in diameter and about five metre long, along with a single 80 metre long trunk for the keel. You would be, it'd be almost impossible to find oaks of this quality and size. Today, uh, the keel of the Gokstad ship required a tall straight oak about 25 metres or 80 feet tall. Um, they did try and find trees that grew naturally in the shapes that they, they wanted as well. Um, and in order to avoid having to transport large pieces of wood from the forest to the shipyard, much of the rough processing took place in, in, in the forests as well. Now, due to the lack of suitable forests, it's unclear whether Iceland had a building tradition during the Viking Age. When the first settlers arrived, much of the land was forested, with birch predominating. However, it would seem that the tall, straight trees needed for keels and masts would be in short supply. So the keel, the stem and the stem post were by far the more critical components of the ships. Um, and uh, errors in the, the design or construction of these would obviously lead to a very poor sailing situation. We don't know what measurement instruments were used. We um, in the construction process, but we do have a number, a, a small number of, of identifiers here. In the Bayou Tapestry here, of course, William, William the Conqueror, William of Normandy, whose ancestor, of course, was the son of the Jarl of Orkney, um, it gives instructions for the construction of two, his invasion fleet to his shipbuilder, who holds a T-shaped uh, broad axe in his hand. You can see that there on the right-hand side of the picture. And in this next slide, you can see the ship that was created.
one of the ships that was created. So we do have some evidence of, of how they measured things and so on. Um, Chapter 88 of Olaf's saga Tryggvasonna tells of the construction of the uh, Ormer and Lange that I was talking about, the Long Serpent. Um, and it says that Thorberger Skafog made the stem and Stern was obliged to leave before the ship was completed. When he returned, he was apparently not pleased with what he saw. Secretly at night, he cut um, crossing diagonal incisions into the upper streaks on one side, ruining the ship. And the next morning, King Olaf, in a rage, vowed death to the man who had done the damage. Thorberger freely admitted to it, and the king ordered him to repair the ship so it was just as fine as before. He didn't replace the damaged drakes, but rather took yet more material off with his ads until the damage disappeared. And everybody agreed the ship now looked better than before, and King Olaf asked him to do the same to the other side of the ship. And as they say, the armor in Lanning was considered to be the best ship ever built in Norway. There's little doubt, of course, that they used plumb lines or something like that, together with staves and strings to lay out the ship. Um, and in one case mentioned in the stories, the ship was built from a model. In chapter five of Krokarev saga, Refer built a ship based on a toy model given to him as a child. And it was considered, as it says in the saga, to be a fine seaworthy ship. We don't know how many man hours were used to, to build the ship, but uh, we do know that it took a lot of time, it took a lot of energy, and it, it, it was incredibly important um, to, do, uh, to do this properly. Um, when they tried to, the modern Nor, uh, Nor replica Rorege took several dozen people two years to build, in part because the Norse construction techniques had to be kind of reinvented. We don't know how the wood was treated um, to prevent rot and attacks by other organisms. It could have been painted, uh, often elaborately. They might have used pine resin to pr help protect the, the hull. But the saga suggests that the ships could be attacked by marine borers. In chapter 13 of Eric's saga, Rauda, uh, but Bjarni's ship became infested with sea worms while returning to Greenland from Vinland, so that the ship was no longer seaworthy. Um, so they drew lots, and those that could fit made their way back to England, uh, I beg your pardon, Greenland in uh, the dinghy or the, the ship's boat, and the rest of the crew perished. Now, we know that they were pulled up on shore and covered during the winter time, and we have these nousts here in Orkney. We can find the places where they pulled them out of the water, so incredibly important. Um, we also know they were highly decorated. There we go. Uh, the Norse loved a bit of bling, they loved their decoration, and ships were often highly decorated. And this is the intricate carving on the stem of the Oseberg ship that I was mentioning earlier. And uh, there's a weather vane from a Norse ship shown to the right. Um, Dragon Head uh, may have decorated the prows and occasionally the sterns of ships, but Early Icelandic laws, as stated in Lannama book, prohibited ships with dragon head prows from entering harbour, lest the frightening appearance of the ship threaten the tranquility of the land with or the, land, uh, the land sprites. Now, a ship's sail was a very precious item. It's quite possible that the sail cost as much to make as the hull. Typically, the sail was made from the finest grade of homespun wool, woven on the same vertical loom in the home that was used for clothing. It has been suggested that it could have taken several years to make. Uh, the fabric needed for a single sail. And it's an interesting fact that um, talking about Viking sails, I was talking about this with a, a, a friend who has a textile company and she became interested in this and she investigated and now she's created reusable face masks using uh, Viking textile techniques, which makes them very um, durable and uh, very good at stopping things passing through them. So it's, it's, the technology that they had is still relevant today. I just throw in that wee anecdote there. Okay. <clears throat> And it was, I mean, the sail for, for one of the Skoldalev ships was probably the order of about 90 square metres, that's uh, 950 square feet when completed. And they would have coated it with animal fats and oils to protect it from the elements. And of course, literary sources tell us that the sails were often striped, and that's certainly the image that we have um, of, the, of the Norse sails. They also had, the sails were attached to um, a kind of um, cruising pole as well, which would um, hold one corner of the sail further forward in order to sail closer to the wind. They had a very flexible mast that was in a, in a kind of binnacle thing that would move around and give them a great deal of flexibility. So these are, these are incredibly flexible um, and uh, effective ships, in point of fact. Now, I'm conscious of time, so I'll just move quickly on uh, to talk about any kind of devices that they might have had for navigational purposes. Now, 
Um, in the late 18th or early 19th century, the sailors in the Faroe Islands were using a wooden disc marked with concentric circles and fitted with a movable vertical gnomon, adjustable for the season, floating in a tub to keep track of their altitude. This may well date from the Viking era, of course. But what they were, what the kind of sailing directions that they had are very much line of sight. For example, their sailing directions in the saga, where if you sail a certain number of days out from Bergen, you turn right, a right hand, you align two mountains, one in Iceland and one in Greenland, Fitzcerca and, and uh, um, another Schwarzcerca one there together, then you can sail to Greenland. So it's very much line of sight. They did not sail at night if they could help it because they couldn't see. They also looked at patterns in the currents in the course of the year, the movement of cetaceans, for example. Um, they looked at all of these things. So they, they, do we know if they used anything that was what we could call uh, a navigational device? Well, um, a sounding uh, uh, lead, for example, we see that on the Bayou Tapestry. This could have been useful. Uh, a gnomon, um, possibly some form likely, but quite difficult to see. Now the sundial, um, not likely. A bearing dial, there's a possible artifact found in Greenland that could be this. The solar stone or the solar steam, uh, there's report for land use only. There was a stone found off Alderney, which um, a few years ago, which they thought might be a solar stone or a sunstone, which helps you to work out the sun's azimuth. But unfortunately, it was made of calcite. And one thing that happens to calcite, as soon as it gets near water, is it goes opaque. So it doesn't work. A uh, quadrant is actually mentioned in a late um, 13th century astronomical text, but we don't know if the Vikings used it. An astrolab, of course, not adapted to sea use until the 16th century. A lodestone or a compass, no sign of an old Norse compass. It's very much a later device. Um, the, the, and the solar stain is not mentioned in the Icelandic family sagas, although the term appears in the contemporary sagas, which take place well after the end of the Viking age. And there are no descriptions of its use for navigation in the stories. It's a great story, even if it were a polarising stones, as some believe, the device would only have had limited navigational use in northern latitudes. Now, some people uh, believe that the, uh, the, the portable sundial, such as I'm talking about, that the Faroe sailors used at the end of the 18th and 19th century, looked a little bit like this. This is a modern reproduction. As you can see, it's it's a wooden disc floating in a pail of water with a gnome one in the middle so they can see where the sun is. And of course, the, the pail of water functioning very much like a binnacle to keep it steady. Um, and this would have worked. Um, in the centre of the disc, there's a vertical peg. At noon, the length of the peg's shadow was marked on the disc. On each day of the voyage after that, the navigator made certain that the sun's shadow fell on the mark at noon, ensuring that the ship maintained a constant latitude. So that's how they used it. Um, and because of the slow apparent vertical motion of the sun in high latitudes, it appears that this device could be effective and accurate. It's, it's not complicated, but it's effective and accurate. Um, large errors in the estimate of local noon or of the date would still allow a navigator to estimate his north-south position to within 30 nautical miles. And if you're using line of sight and you know that you should have two things aligned, as soon as they start to deviate, you know you've got a problem already. So it's nice to think that they would have indeed use them. Now, we do know that there is evidence that there was some kind of skilled astronomical observation made during the Norse era. Um, uh, Einar in Los Vetninga Saga often went out at night to study with care the objects in the night sky. Um, and several of the earliest surviving Icelandic textbooks, although dating from after the Norse era, covered astronomy. By the beginning of the 12th century, Stjörnu Odi Helgeson, or Star Odi, had created Odentala, which is the detailed azimuth charts of the sun's uh, altitude at noon, and it's bearing at sunrise and sunset for every day of the year in Iceland. I've got a picture of it for you because I think it's an important thing to see, but I'm afraid it's not a very good picture because it's not very good condition. There it is. And you, but you can vaguely see some of the circles and the, and the information about the sun. It's, it's not a big book. It's only a couple of pages long, divided into three chapters. And the first chapter presents the exact date and time of summer and winter solstices with relation um, uh, to the sun. Uh, and the second chapter, Audi specifies the sun's position over the year. And in the last chapter, the direction of dawn and nightfall through the years described. In addition, the Norse navigators understood the relationship between latitude and the sun's height at noon. 
The chapter two of Greenland Saga describes the, men, the motion of the sun in winter as observed in Vinland in an apparent attempt to fix the latitude of the site. Right. Uh, now, typical Norse voyages were often along the coast at a safe distance offshore. As I said, the dead reckoning between points was used to determine distance run, sailing at night, avoided, ships were beached at the end of the day, avoiding navigational hazards difficult to see at night and allowing a cooking fire or something like that to be safely kindled. And they, they did use islands a lot. For example, when they were at a, a Ting site or something like that, which had an island, they would have what's called a, a dritte, which is a, excuse me, it's a shit island. It's a place where everybody would be able to avail themselves of the facilities and things like that. Very efficient, really, in many ways. But they were very cautious, although they were, you know, they were brave and heroic sailors, they were cautious and sensible. As I was alluding to earlier, voyages were started only under the most favourable weather conditions. There are examples in the stories where folk wait for months to get the right conditions to set out. Um, and it's likely that they're, they're not necessarily waiting for fair winds, they're waiting for good visibility. Um, and when they needed to cross open ocean, they sailed along lines of constant latitude until they reached their destination. Um, we, texts seem to indicate that navigators had a, quite a clear mental picture of the layout of the world. Uh, for example, to them, Iceland was opposite a certain point on the Norwegian coast. If one sailed west from this traditional departure point and one maintained a constant latitude, one expected to see certain marine creatures and certain cloud formations and certain landmarks at certain times, and ultimately to reach Iceland a certain time later. Um, also, what was important was to make sure that you had, the, the Norse had a very interesting attitude towards people with what we'd call second sight in Scotland. Um, in Scotland, that's not a very positive thing to have. In the Norse tradition, it's quite positive. It's a useful because you can find out what's going to happen in the future. Um, so that um, you, would, you would seek guidance from a seer or something about whether your activity uh, was going to go very well. So we know that, for example, that sailing from um, Norway to Greenland would take about 850 nautical miles. But navigation marks existed that could be used even in the open ocean by the Viking sailors, the, the whale feeding grounds, the concentrations of nautical birds, the swells in the sea could all be used to confirm along with the line of sight that the ship was on course. Um, so they, they, from that point of view, they were, in, they were very important, but let us not underestimate the power of oral history. Uh, we, we know that the Norse sailors must have used the arts of dead reckoning, of using a line to measure depth and determining position from the sun and stars. But clearly, one of the main qualifications of a Norse navigator was that he had been to the destination before. And I'll stop there. Thank you and ask if there are any questions. And I will uh, just come out of this presentation and change my input so you can see me in full, I hope. Let me just pop this up. If anyone has any questions, can they um, use that raise their hand function? All right. I'm not seeing anyone yet, so. Anything from anyone? Oh, Richard, Dylan, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Richard? Liam, Belusishin. Hi, yeah. Um, I was just a quick question about uh, the keel on the on the boat. So presumably with a shallow draft and that there wasn't much of a keel, I mean, did that affect uh, say, their ability to sail or was the, or was that kind of compensated in how flexible the mast and the sail was? Well, it meant it meant that they could skip over the top of the waves rather than be buffeted by them. They're not, when they're sailing, they're not pushing through the waves in the same way. They're skipping over the top, which gave them very good speed and manoeuvrability. And sometimes they had to bring the sail into play depending on what the, the weather was like. For example, if there's no wind, they're going to be rowing. If there's wind, they're going to be using their sails. So they've got this flexibility there, but it made them very light 
very manoeuvrable colleagues that have worked uh, or have sailed on the replica ships have said that it takes a wee while to manage them because you sail them in a different way from a modern boat but when you do get the hang of it they're incredibly manoeuvrable and fast and that makes them very effective both with the rowing and, and the sailing. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Peter, I can see your hand is up. Do you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Peter? If you're struggling with your muting, Peter, you can always put the question in the chat and I can open the chat. Yeah. If that would help, because sometimes there could be a fankel with a microphone or something. Oh, I've just opened the chat, so. Well, unmute. I've unmuted now. Yes. Yes, that's... you have indeed. <laughs> can you hear me? Good. Um, I'm actually calling from um, uh, following you from Denmark. Uh, Peter Campbell Benstead. I've got my roots in Braga on the Isle of Lewis. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can hear you, Peter. Falcher. Okay. And I'm part of the, thank you, I'm part of the Hebridean diaspora and I've been based in Copenhagen and Roskilde for the last 35 years. And I wondered if you had a comment regarding the various reasons for the Viking diaspora. And I'm thinking about what is the more most important reason for this diaspora, because you talked about those who have traveled out to explore and conquer, but is this the whole story? Is there not also an important story relevant to our times with regard to those who fled Denmark, Norway, because of local conflicts, local warlords? That was my question. Yes, indeed. Of course, the, the accepted narrative for the Viking expansion is that um, in many cases it was seeking new lands and honour and valour because it's in Havamal, cattle die, kinsmen die, a man dies just the same. I know one thing that never dies, a man's good name, and it's all about your reputation because as we know, the, the Vikings weren't interested in what you said or what you thought, only in what you did. Um, so the accepted view is that they went out to look for honour and victory, but actually what happened in many cases is the, the Nordic kingdoms are some of the earliest kingdoms to be developed. Mm -hmm. And um, for, for a lot of the, the chiefs, they couldn't be putting up with this. They'd been autonomous in their own areas and then comes along comes Harald Fairhair, basically, and takes over the whole of Norway and they flounce off in the huff because uh, they're going to be subject to a king and so on. And there's, yes, there's internecine warfare, there's um, the, the loss of power, so they seek somewhere else to go. There's also mercantile trading issues. There's also Norse inheritance laws, which can divide up an inheritance into a, 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 a plot of land that's really not feasible to support people. So you find that people have to, especially in the north of Norway, there's a narrow strip of usable land between the mountains and the sea. Um, that's not enough, so people have to go abroad and set. But the official version is for honour and democracy. Yeah. Yes, which is which is a good story. It's a good story. <laughs> it's a good story. Not entirely the story, but it's thank thank you. It's a very good answer. You're welcome. So we've got Helen in the chat asking, could you just repeat the source and name of the man who took the hardware from the boats and burnt the timber, please? Yes, I was just trying to type that up quickly there, but um, uh, that was, uh, it, it says since chapter two of Grunlinga Saga, that's uh, Grunlinga Theta, I beg your pardon, not Saga Theta, that's the short stories in a saga. A saga is very much, um, you know, it doesn't have direct speech and things like that. Uh, a theta is more like a small story that might be more of an anecdote in it, where you get more um, speech, and it's Sigurdur and it's party. So it's chapter two of Grunlinga Theta. It's just the stories there. And a, a theatre is where you get more sort of narrative and, and direct speech. You don't get a lot of direct speak, speech in the saga because, as I said, they're not interested in what you've got to say, only in what you do. Um, but the theatre are more the kind of um, anecdotes. So that's what it is. So it's Sigurdur, Chapter 2, Grandindiga, Theatre. Sorry, I was typing that up. I'll just get rid of it off the screen there. <laughs> I hope that uh, that's helpful to you, Helen. It's worth having a look at these things. There's a lot of very, um, you know, interesting little stories encapsulated in the sagas themselves as Sogler. You find these little stories in there, like, um, I suppose, like fruit in a fruitcake, just studying the whole narrative 
uh, with interesting little vignettes. And one of the oldest ones, and one of my personal favourites, and I'm going to say it because it uh, it does deal with ships, is the story of Alden, um, who is an Icelander from the West Fjords, which instantly tells us that he's one of the poorer Icelanders. And this is a story about an uh, Icelandic boy making good and getting one over on the Norwegians. And it's also about how honour um, results in good fortune because the Norse didn't believe that uh, good luck was accidental. It was a reward for good behaviour. It's karma, if you like. So Alden then, uh, he has an old mother. Let's not forget about this old mother. We'll come back to her. Um, and he works for a farmer and does so well that the farmer takes a fancy to him. And there's a skipper staying um, over the winter who takes a fancy to him too and offers him a trip to Norway in the ship. And he leaves enough food and stuff for his old mother for three years. Don't forget about the old mother. She's crucial to the plot. Vikings, good to their mothers. So offsets out then and they, they, they go to Greenland and he buys a polar bear, a baby polar bear. And you might ask yourself, why is he doing this? Oh, but there's a method in this. So he gets to Norway and it gets about that he has a polar bear. And the king of Norway, who's none other than Harald Hardrada himself, uh, calls him in and says, oh, you've got a polar bear. And Odin says, yes. And Harald says, I'll buy it from you. Odin says, no. Harald says, I'll give you twice what you paid. Odin says, no. Then Harald says something that's very strange to us, our modern ears. I will let you give me the bear. And what he's doing there is he's treating Odin like an equal and he will give him huge rewards for this bear. And Odin says, no, I'm going to go and give it to Swain of Denmark, who's the arch enemy of Harald Hardrada at this particular point. And Harald says, well, I could take this bear from you. And Odin says, you could, but you're not. And Harald says, you're right. Come back when Swain has dealt with you and tell me how he dealt with you. So to cut a long story short, Odin goes to Swain. Swain receives him very well, um, uh, takes him to his court. Uh, makes him a courtier, Othan wants to go on pilgrimage, Swain lets him go, and finally it comes to the point where Othan has to return to the old mother. I hope you weren't forgetting about the old mother. And he goes to Swain and he says, I must return to Iceland to my old mother. And Swain says, well, only for that reason can I let you go, because we must look after our old mothers. And he says, now I'll reward you for the bear. And he gives him um, a ship and he says, but you could be wrecked and nobody would know that you'd gone to Swain and been rewarded for your bear. Or as they have it in the in the saga, it's... Um, in Mikla Gorsami, a great treasure in the form of a bear, basically. Um, so uh, he gives them then bags of silver and gold and so forth. And um, he says, but you could lose this. So finally he gives them a big armband, you know, the kind of thing, big gold thing that goes up your arm and says, and even if you're shipwrecked, you can keep this. And then he says, if you meet an outstanding man, you could give it to him. So you can see where this is going. So um, Alvin goes back to Harald Hardrada and Harald says, well, how did Swain deal with you? Um, and uh, uh, Alden explains that Swain gave him a ship and Harold says, yes, I would have done that and about the gold and so forth. And Harold says, I would have done that. And then he said, he gave me this armband. And Harold says, well, he's done more for you than I would have done. And then Alden takes the armband off his uh, arm and presents it to Harold. And he said, he told me to give it to an outstanding man. And here you are, because you could have taken my bear. So of course, then Harold rewards him with not one, not two, but three ships filled to the gun all the stuff. And the last line of this is, and he returned to Iceland a little better off than when he left. And actually, that little story, that little setter, tells you all you need to know about the Norsemen and their attitude. But because it's a setter, it's got conversation. But a saga doesn't tend to. I, sorry, I'm wittering on. I see that somebody's, people have got their hands up there. Yes, it's Richard that's come back. He's put his hand up. Richard, are you able to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, hello. Um, there's an account of the siege of Dumbarton Rock or Dumbarton Castle where 200 ships were used to transport slaves from that siege from Strathclyde to the slave market in Dublin. Um, and there's much commentary now about the impact of the transatlantic slave trade and the economic benefit it brought to to the UK and very recently how it funded the purchase of Highland Estates. Um, to what extent was um, Viking trade routes um, influenced or motivated by a, the slave trade in that area. 
Well, that's a very timid question because, of course, we're very much reflecting on, on Scotland and slavery. I'm actually on the national panel um, uh, to do this because I'm a, um, trust, a board member of the Museums Gallery Scotland. So it's a very timid question. Thank you. Now, the thing about slaves. Um, of course, the Norse had slaves. They, they absolutely did. There was three strata in society. One of them was the thralls or the slaves. Um, they certainly used them um, and they were valuable commodities. But they, they, um, I'm not saying they weren't bad to them, but they treated them as a valuable commodity and therefore they were given some care and attention. Also, a lot of the slaves ended up in the Viking colonies, such as um, Iceland, where they worked alongside um, the farmers. It's not it's not quite the same as being on a plantation in the Caribbean. Everybody was working together. And if you were a hard worker, you could make some kind of a life for yourself. You could get a small piece of land, you could take a wife, you could have some kind of life for yourself. Um, so it was slightly, they were slightly more, they were more likely to be traded than, you know, worked to death or anything like that. They were, they were a valuable thing, just like the amber and the furs and things like that. Um, of, of course, in the uh, the time of the, uh, the, the Norse, um, slavery was quite a feature of most societies, unfortunately, but not quite on the scale of the transatlantic slave trade at all. Um, and in many ways, if you were taken as a slave by the Norse, you perhaps had a better chance of surviving or perhaps, not always, of course, but a, a chance of perhaps having some sort of a life because you were a valuable commodity and because people were working in colonies. This, this is why the Norse were, had better rights for women than we had in this country up until um, the Married Women's Property Act at the end of the 19th century, because they needed the women uh, in the colonies. They needed, you know, they needed them to have children. They needed them to work. They, they, they were valuable human beings there. Um, but it, it, you know, it's important to remember these things and to reflect on that. But um, unfortunately, slavery has been with us for a very long time. And of course, it's still with us today in many ways. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? At all? Peter, is your hand still up or? Have you asked your question or have you got another question? Your hand's still up. No other question from Peter. In Denmark. So if nobody else has any questions, then it just leaves me to thank Professor Donna Hedel for doing tonight's talk for us. Um, Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Really good um, to hear all about um, Vikings and their, their boats. And um, I also have to thank Borth McGallick and for Museums Gallery Scotland for the funding that they've given for the series of talks. And I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, I'll just say um, good night all and I hope you enjoyed it. And hopefully, um, make some, do some more talks like this in the future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.